Well, good morning again. My name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and it is terrific to have you here this morning. And um, yes, I'm going to try to do this standing. This is my first time since ankle surgery uh, on June 27th. I was told before the service, if I really need a chair, just signal and one will be brought to me. Uh, the signal for that would be if I am flopping around on the floor. So um, that would be your sign that I need a chair. It is great to have so many of the kids with us this morning. Um, they were in here for the family dedication and they get to stay and um, we had the kids with us all summer and it was a lot of fun and it's really good to have them back. So um, this goes on the list of stories that you shouldn't tell when you're a diabetic and your doctor is in the room. Um, that would be the reference to Allison earlier. Um, I don't know about you. Ann and I are incredibly excited about something that is about to happen in this community. Andy's frozen custard is coming to town. Um, it's going to be conveniently located right across the street from where I work out. <laughs> which means I don't have to wait at all to lose any benefit from my exercise. Now, Ann and I occasionally visit either the Andes and Tyler or the Andes that is very close to her sister's house uh, in Dallas. And when we go, we're usually very careful because I am diabetic. So I'll get like a child size. And, you know, if I happen to have been really good about my eating that week and my blood sugar is really good, I might on a very rare occasion get a regular size. Well, on one particular visit, I noticed on the menu that they had a Sunday that had absolutely everything that I love on it and nothing that I don't like. And I'd been really good that week. So I'm thinking to myself, let's just get the regular size. And so I just ordered it. I'd like the Titanic, please. <laughs> now you're laughing. Because you see, I wasn't thinking. And when I ordered the thing and got it, this thing was huge. And I wondered out loud, why is this thing so big? And Anne wondered out loud, what were you thinking when you ordered something that was called the Titanic? And I said, well, I was kind of expecting a lifeboat, not the entire cruise ship. But then I decided, okay, I don't really need to eat this whole thing. I could just eat kind of a regular sized portion. And it was literally at that moment that my doctor's office called. <laughs> and they said, we have the results from your blood test. And that is fantastic. Your blood sugar is lower than a lot of people who don't have diabetes. Whatever you are doing, it's working. <laughs> Great news. And I looked at my Titanic and now I have a dilemma. I can respond to this good news as an invitation to return to bad behavior, or I can take this as an affirmation of continuing good behavior. I won't tell you what I did. I, um, I'll just say this, that every time I am staring at a dessert, Anne now says, remember the Titanic. The book of Micah 
is actually a book of cycles. There are three different cycles in Micah. And they are cycles between bad news and good news. Micah 1 is about God coming to judge the people. Chapter 2 then explains why. They are greedy. They are corrupt. The leaders are oppressing the poor. But then chapter 2 ends with hope. There is going to be restoration. There is going to be redemption. Chapter 3, and we looked at this last week, Adam took us through it. It's a chapter that returns to the subject of judgment. It starts the second cycle. And this time the evidence that we saw through Adam's sermon last week was the misuse of power and their desire for more. And this morning starts with hope. This morning in chapter 4, we enter the hope section of the second cycle. And in the first five verses of chapter 4, Micah is going to give his people reason to hope. He gives them good news about the long-term future. God will be glorified. That's verses 1 and 2. There will be peace. That's verses 3 and 4. And then in verse 5, Micah gives his audience what I needed when I got that phone call from my doctor. He says, in light of the good news that I am about to, or that I have given you, that you have received, here is how you live. Here is what you do. And that is verse 5. Micah is going to tell them there is a way to live in light of the future. And that way is going to impact the people around them. Now, if you remember last week, chapter 3 ended with the city of Jerusalem in ruins. The temple was wiped out. The mountain where the temple stood is just now an ordinary hill. Remember, the temple is a symbol of God's presence with his people. So when chapter 3 ends, it's like it's ending with the message that the glory of God is absent from his people. And that is the judgment that they have to suffer because of their idolatry of power. And if that's where chapter 3 ends, where chapter 4 begins is a stark contrast. Because now the picture is of a future with unimaginable glory. Verse 1 shows us that Micah has radically shifted his time reference. He's talking about the latter days. This is a way of saying the end of history. It refers to what we might call the end times. Micah is now looking way beyond the coming defeat that Israel is going to face. There's looking at way beyond even the, the restoration that will come after that defeat into something that is far, far future. He is looking at something that's going to happen at the very end of history. And he sees God as present with his people. More than that, the nations all around them have abandoned their false gods and they have turned to the true God, and the true God is the center of everything and everyone. This is unimaginable glory for God and God's people. Chapter 3 ended with the temple completely destroyed, and the mountain had stood on just as this ordinary hill. Chapter 4 opens by focusing on that same mountain, and now it's so different. The mountain is no longer just an ordinary wooded hill. It is the highest of the mountains. It is lifted up above all hills. That's a way of saying it is the most honored, the most important of all of the places. And using the image of a roaring river, verse 1 ends by saying that people from all nations are literally flowing to this place. And then verse 2 explains why. This is where the nations meet God. Notice that we're no longer talking about just the Jewish people. This is talking about every nation. It's saying that they have laid aside their idols to get to know the one true God. These nations are coming from all over to the temple. They're coming to learn about God and how to live a life that honors him. The pictures of the truth and transforming power of God's word radiating out to the whole earth. The people are drawn to know God and drawn to a life that honors him. 
In chapters 1, 2, and 3, the nations came to destroy God's people. Now they have come to join God's people. I love that in verse 2, the people are saying that they are going to the house of the God of Jacob. Jacob is a way of referring to the Jewish people. And when you see this phrase, the God of Jacob, what's being emphasized is the special caring relationship that God has for his people. The special relationship that exists between God and God's people. And the nations are drawn to God because of how God relates to Israel. Step back and think about that for a second. We have just spent three chapters with the message being God is coming in judgment. We have spent three chapters talking about the fact that the people are going to be overrun by enemies. They are going to be deported. They're going to be exiled. But despite all of that, God's love and care and faithfulness is going to come through so clearly that it's going to be obvious to all the nations. And the nations are going to see who God is because they're going to see how God relates to his people. And in seeing who God is through how he relates to his people, they're going to say, I want to know that God. Micah's audience could never imagine that the people who would soon become their enemies and scatter them throughout the land would one day join them in worship of the true God. Micah's audience couldn't even begin to imagine that their God would one day be glorified throughout the entire earth. But God promises them that when the world sees how God relates to his people, the world will want to know him. Creates a question for us, doesn't it? Do people see how God relates to you? Do people see how God relates to me? About a month ago, um, I had a spot on my back that was diagnosed as melanoma, a form of skin cancer. Just this past Thursday... I got the report that the procedure to remove it was completely successful. All the cancer is gone. Now, there are two ways I can talk about that. Right? I can make God the hero of that story, or I can make something else the hero of that story. I can make something else the hero of that story by saying things like, I was really lucky that a doctor who was looking at one thing came across this spot and suggested that I have it evaluated. I can say that although Ann and I were concerned, we were confident that everything would be okay and then never mention why. Or I can make God the hero of the story by saying that the Lord protected me by having the cancer found quickly and having it dealt with before it spread. I can make the Lord the hero of the story by talking about how Ann and I were concerned But the Lord reassured us that no matter what happened, his love and his goodness are not going to change. I want to make God the hero of my story. I want people to say, let's go to the house of the God of Todd and Ann Malone. Not because Todd is great, but because people know enough of my life and how God is at work in my life that they can say, His God is great. Can you imagine how verses 1 and 2 would have sounded to people who had just been told they were going to be overrun by enemies, exiled and scattered, and the very symbol of God's presence with them destroyed? How does it sound to them to hear that a day is coming when all of that's going to be undone? A day will come when nations are so amazed at how God is at work with the very people who feel God abandoned him 
that these old enemies will now flow to the Lord. Well, verses 3 and 4 actually take it a step further. A day is coming where God will bring about unimaginable peace. Verse 3 is quoted a lot. There's actually a statue based on verse 3 and its parallel passage in Isaiah 2, standing outside the United Nations. I was going to show a picture of that, but I decided since kids were going to be here, a mostly naked man pounding a sword into a plow probably was not appropriate. Um, so, But it is a well-known verse about peace. There are actually copies of that statue in countries all over the world. And the idea of this verse that is trying to be captured in these statues is that weapons of warfare are turned into tools that give life. It's a picture of worldwide lasting peace. There is no need for the tools of warfare anymore. And I find the reason for that peace fascinating. God is going to judge And sometimes we think that saying that God will judge just doesn't sound very nice about God. But verse 3 shows why God's justice and judgment are so important. When the perfectly just, perfectly righteous God rules, there is no basis for conflict. When God is judge, you know the standard is right, and you know that it's applied fairly. Over the summer, when we had the kids uh, in here, we did a lot of superhero illustrations. At the end of the summer, some well-meaning person came up to me and said, um, you know, you could have mixed in like some princess stories. Uh, from which she got back from me a blank stare. Um, but here is my best effort. What do Cinderella and her stepsisters want? Do you remember? Want to go to the ball? Why do they want to go to the ball? The prince. They want to marry the prince. That's the conflict, really, that's operating throughout the movie. Cinderella and the stepsisters both want to marry the prince. And the the stepsisters and their mom try to keep Cinderella from going to the ball. And after the ball, they try to keep Cinderella away from the prince's representative. At the end of the movie, there isn't that conflict anymore. Why? Yeah, because, right, there's a very clear standard, and it was fairly applied to everyone, and it was clear what was right. The rightful princess had to fit into the medically dangerous, completely impractical glass slipper. (laughs) Everyone was given a chance. It only fits Cinderella. Like it or not, there wasn't room to disagree anymore. It was settled by the application of justice and judgment. That's what verse 3 is all about. When creation is completely under God's perfect application of justice and judgment, there will be peace. There is no basis for conflict. No one will lack what they need. No one will say God wasn't fair. The perfect judge will bring lasting peace. Verse 4 takes the image a step further. Because you see, in the Bible, peace isn't just about the absence of conflict. It means to flourish. And that's the idea of dwelling under a grapevine and a fig tree. That was a way of saying that the people lived in peace and prosperity. It's a picture of contentment. And rest, it's a picture of thriving, of flourishing. See, the weapons that have been turned into plows are actually going to be productive as plows. The people under God's care will not face enemies. They will have everything that they need to thrive. Micah wants his audience to know that disaster is coming. Because of their corruption... Enemies are coming that will bring war and destruction. That was the message behind chapters 1, most of chapter 2, and all of chapter 3. But Micah also wants them to know that as they go into that judgment, there is an end. After judgment comes peace. That was the end of chapter 2. But beyond that, a day is coming even further out when God's rule leads to a lasting peace 
a lasting prosperity, a lasting commitment, contentment, and it will include the whole world. The section ends in verse 5 with Micah telling the audience how to live in light of the good news that they received in verses 1 through 4. And that is to make the unimaginable imaginable. Micah shifts time frames again. In verse 5, he's now in the present. We know this because of how he describes the people, the nations. In verses 1 through 4, he talked about them as coming to the temple to learn about God, to follow God. But now in verse 5, he shifts. He's describing them as walking in the name of their own God. That's what they were doing during Micah's lifetime. It's not what they will do in the future. So Micah has shifted his focus to the present. Now, to walk in the name of a God was to identify with that God. It was to reflect, to live out the character of that God. So if you worshipped a God of war, you took on the character of a warrior people. If you worshipped a God of, of farming and agriculture, that's what you took on. And then you looked to that God as your source of help and your source of strength. A day will come, according to verse 2, when the nations will look like the true God, and they will look to the true God for their strength and their help. But that's not the day that Micah lives in. The day that Micah lives in, they look to their idols. Do you see what God is telling his people to do? They are to live today the way the nations will live someday. They are to live today the way that the nations around them will live in the future. God's people are to be living pictures of the unimaginable future. Micah ends verse 5 by saying that they must walk in the name of the Lord our God forever. The response to the good news they receive in verses 1 through 4 is to live as if that good news is present reality. And God is calling us that exact same assignment. Our job is to show the world that the unimaginable is in fact imaginable because God is at work. Now, let me make this very practical. What do you do if someone in the church upsets you? Do you leave? Do you punch them in the throat? Yes, I heard that. Do you ignore it and hope it goes away? Do you tell other people how that person hurt you? Those are the behaviors of a culture that walks in the name of other gods. That is the behavior of people who think that their help and their strength come from being right, come from being better than others, or come from being comfortable. Because if you think that your help and strength comes from being right, then you don't reconcile with people. You argue until you get the last word. If you think that your help and your strength comes from being better than someone else, you don't reconcile relationships. You talk about those people to other people around you, and you put them down. If you think your health and strength comes from comfort, you don't reconcile broken relationships. You just hope that the problem goes away. People who walk in the name of the Lord our God, live differently. They know that fixing broken relationships, for example, requires vulnerability. They know it's a risk that they might get hurt. And so people who walk in the name of the Lord go to the Lord and ask him for help and strength. And by God's power, they go to other people and say, I hurt you, I am sorry. Can we rebuild this relationship? Or they go to someone and say, I was hurt by you, but I forgive you. Can we rebuild our relationship? 
That's what it looks like to make the unimaginable imaginable. How do we do that? People who walk in the name of the Lord know that pain and loss of life do not define them and do not control them. If someone you love dearly rejects you, you are going to feel incredible pain, and that is appropriate. But you will not go through that pain alone. And that pain will not be with you forever. You will experience the joy of God being known by you and through you. You will experience the peace of knowing that God is caring for you. You will know that joy and peace, maybe only in part in this lifetime, but someday you will know it fully. And that confidence sustains us as we make the unimaginable imaginable, even when it makes us vulnerable. Micah, five, Micah 4, 1 through 5, assures us that if we are open enough with our lives, with our relationships, the Holy Spirit will use it to draw people to the Lord. So let me sum up the book of Micah so far. Because God is good, he is going to wipe away the corruption that fills the earth. Because God is loving and faithful, he has an unimaginable future for his people. When we hear that message, there is a very common response. We look at ourselves and we say, am I really God's people? We know how broken we are. If we're perfectly honest for five minutes, we know that we have done plenty in our lives that would lead an absolutely perfect, righteous God to reject us. How do we know that we are God's people? Jordan talked about it earlier during communion. You know that you are God's per, God, part of God's people because you have trusted that Jesus' death on the cross was enough to wipe clean all the wrong that you have ever done and give you a clean record now and forever. If you have done that, you're one of his people. It's not up to your performance. It's up to Jesus' performance. And that is the good news. So now the question is, how do we live in light of that good news? And the point of Micah 4, 1 through 5, the point of this sermon, is that the response to future flourishing is present faithfulness. The response to future flourishing is present faithfulness. Anne keeps telling me to remember the Titanic. See, there was a price for using good news as an opportunity to turn back to bad habits. Micah would tell us, remember the future. We will know God lifted up and glorified above all else. We will know the peace, the flourishing that comes with complete and perfect provision. We will know these things in wonderful glimpses now, but there will only be glimpses. But a day is going to come when we will know them in full. And so we live today to make that unimaginable day as imaginable as possible for the people around us. How to respond? Suggest three things. First is pray. I always try to include something about prayer because it is a reminder that we don't live the Christian life just by our own effort and trying harder and working harder. We live it dependent upon the Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit. So pray that God would give us more confidence, more understanding of his plans for our future. 
Pray that that future would become more and more real to you. Share. And I keep trying to say this through this series, probably every week I preach. Answer the discussion questions with someone. That's why they are there. It's so that we as community can enter into discussion with one another and encourage one another and sharpen one another and help one another grow. And then finally, I'm encouraging you to review. The theme for this entire year has been focused on who is our God. So that as we know him better, we will worship him more fully and reflect him more completely in our character. And so through this series, I want to challenge you with every passage we read. Slow down and observe what does it say about who our God is. I invite the prayer team to come forward. These are folks who are here to pray with you, to encourage you. Because we live not in Micah 4, 1 through 4, but we live in Micah 4, verse 5. We live in a present day when the people around us follow their own gods. When the people around us pull us to walk away from the true God. We are men and women who want to pray with you, encourage you, support you as you seek to know and to follow the true God. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, we have been reminded that we live in a world dedicated to following things that in no way reflect your character. Lord, we live in a world that follows God's like comfort, making ourselves feel superior, protecting ourselves. And Lord, you call us to something so different. Help us not to look like those gods. Help us to look like you, who loves us even when we were your enemies and pursued us with your own son, that we might live in relationship and in harmony with you, both now and forever. Lord, that is our desire. Help us to make the unimaginable imaginable. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's your thought. There is no power on earth that can keep God from being glorified and bringing flourishing to his people. That's really the impact of Micah 4, 1 through 5. And so Micah's challenge to you is to leave here and show the world the wonder the unimaginable wonder of life with God. You're dismissed.